And so, all across the world, the power of the national governments dwindled. In their place rose the megacorporations. Where once there had been senates, parliaments, and the electorate, there were now only shareholders. Citizens became employees. Have you heard this story before? Probably. The idea of a megacorporation, or group of megacorporations, taking over the responsibilities of a government is one that's been around for a while, and there are plenty of examples across alternate worlds. But is it believable? And more importantly, does it make for an interesting setting? In my opinion, the answer to both of these questions is not really. Mega corporations definitely have a place in world building, but as soon as that corporation becomes what's known as a corporate republic, I lose interest pretty quick. So before we get into it, just so there's no confusion, allow me to explain exactly what I'm talking about here. As with most things related to political structures, the exact nature of a corporate republic can be nebulous. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to define it as the following. A form of government run like a business in which all aspects of society are privatized by a single or small group of companies. The ultimate goal of this state is to increase the wealth of its shareholders. And the government acknowledges its status as a corporation. So let's start first with why I think this type of nation isn't very believable. In our own world, various corporations have reached an almost unprecedented level of economic power, but this still pales in comparison to Earth's most powerful nations. Long before a corporation ever approached the ability to compete with the United States, for example, it would have been crushed under the weight of various antitrust laws. These type of laws have been around since the time of the Roman Empire, and they're now a global standard of international trade. It's not likely they're going anywhere. But let's assume for the moment that somehow this balance of power shifted dramatically and a corporation was able to buy control of a country, either an impoverished corrupt state or even a modern developed nation. Now I am not an economist, but I do know that the world's economy is tremendously globalized. It would be outright impossible for any powerful nation or corporation to exist without a constant influx of resources, capital, and talent from across the planet. A corporation taking over a country sets a dangerous precedent, and I imagine that every other major nation across the world would be more than willing to embargo the new corporate state until it collapses, or at the very least strengthen their own anti-monopoly laws to prevent it from spreading. But even if a corporation was somehow able to get away with this, controlling a nation is probably just a giant waste of money. Diversifying is one of the riskiest corporate strategies, and there's no guarantee a company would be able to effectively manage a government, let alone make any sort of profit. In 1982, Colgate launched a line of frozen dinners. It went so badly that even their sales of toothpaste plunged. My point here is that even for an experienced corporation, pursuing growth with a new product or service can be difficult. Trying to expand into every product or service is likely impossible. Take the complexity of producing and marketing frozen dinners, multiply it by a few trillion, and that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of the difficulty of running a national government. So, while Wayland Corp might be able to buy an island in the Pacific, by the time they developed the necessary infrastructure, paid for all their employees to relocate there, and attempt to keep all of this organized, they'd probably go bankrupt. So while dominating a country through economic means is probably out, what if a corporation somehow was able to establish its own private military, one powerful enough to force the surrender of a major nation state? Well, private military corporations do exist and many continue to support major militaries in various peacekeeping roles, and others have even proved decisive in winning civil wars. But the key factor here is that in each instance, these companies were fighting a poorly equipped and trained opposition, and they didn't need tremendously powerful and expensive hardware. Against a Russian armored column or US Navy battle group, even the most powerful PMCE would last all of two minutes. Russia can afford to maintain thousands of tanks, and the United States can operate 10 aircraft carriers without either country worrying about their profitability. A corporation, by contrast, would have tremendous difficulty doing the same, even if they somehow managed to justify the expense to their shareholders. There just isn't a lot of profit to be found in showing up at the United Nations and declaring war on everybody. Nobody with a stake in the company would agree to it. Why would they? Now, the last major opposition I have to the believability of a corporation taking control of a government has to do with national identity and ideology. Nations are typically founded on great principles and values, and regardless of how well a country does at living up to these, the fact that they are often enshrined in declarations and constitutions is a very powerful motivating factor. Across history, 
Millions have fought, bled, and died for abstract concepts like freedom, democracy, communism, and many others. But a corporation by its very nature exists solely to make a profit for its shareholders, and I think it would be very hard to find anyone willing to put their life on the line so their CEO could become a little richer. If Omni Consumer Products declared war on the US tomorrow, how many of its own employees would side with the company over their country? Not enough for them to win at the very least. So now that I've talked about how tremendously unlikely it is that a mega corporation could ever take over part of the world, I should probably mention an example of where basically that exact thing happened. At its height, the British East India Company ruled over much of the Indian subcontinent, maintained its own private army twice the size of the British military, and its wealth was measured in the trillions, far more than even the largest modern conglomerates. So does this prove everything I've said is completely wrong? Well, I don't think so. In fact, it's probably the opposite. Despite its size, the East India Company was only sporadically profitable, and required frequent government intervention to stay afloat. Corruption was widespread, and its armies were forced to put down almost constant insurgencies. During the Indian Rebellion of 1857, which would see the complete collapse of the company, many of its own armies were the first to revolt. When the British Empire decided to assume direct control, the East India Company, for all its power, was helpless to stop it. But once again, for the sake of argument, let's say that some amazing new technology has allowed future corporations to amass unthinkable wealth, power, and private armies. Through some brilliant political and economic maneuvering that perfectly manages to sidestep all my concerns, it somehow manages to take control of a major nation or even the entire world. I still don't find this very interesting. And it all goes back to my ideology argument. When coming up with a world and storyline, whether for games, movies, books, whatever, I prefer that opposing factions have different philosophies and different principles. In Warhammer 40,000, the Tau Empire and the Imperium of Man, to put it mildly, have very different ideals on how the galaxy should be run. That makes them great antagonists. But in the Mutant Chronicles, why should I care which mega corporation defeats the others? They all basically want the same thing, and aside from a few superficial details, are identical to one another. Lastly, a mega corporation can be counted on to act in its own self-interest, which is always profit. This makes them kind of spineless. The Rebel Alliance will endure sacrifice and hardship to liberate the galaxy no matter the cost, while the Interstellar Manufacturing Corporation will immediately give up on taking over the frontier the second it starts affecting the bottom line. That's not that intimidating. So are there any exceptions to my opposition to corporate governments? Well, I can mention a couple. I find the Kaldari State from EVE Online somewhat interesting in that it's not a single mega corporation but a coalition that operates their government. This addresses many of my issues. It's easier for a group of companies rather than a single one to bear the investment cost of taking over a government, but it raises many more questions. How is this government run? How is the system stable? How do organizations like the armed forces operate? There may be perfectly reasonable answers to these questions, but I'm not knowledgeable enough in EVE lore to answer them. There's also the Helgen Corporation from Killzone. Although I'm slightly cheating here because the Helgen Corporation completely abandoned any pretense of being a company the moment it transitioned into the Helgen Empire. That to me is way more realistic and I can accept it. So I'll end this video by saying that while I don't think mega corporations make particularly believable governments, they can still be a captivating element in any setting. A mega corporation that acts behind the scenes, manipulating governments rather than trying to control them, is not only more realistic in my opinion, but more interesting. Wayland Dutani, the Terrell Corporation, the Iron Bank, these are all examples of mega corporations done right. But that's just my opinion, which means that it is an undeniable fact because I and I alone sit atop a fortress of unassailable truth. But if you still think I got it all wrong, let me know in the comments below. Can a mega corporation work as a government? Is fighting for profit just as interesting as fighting for communism or for the Kaiser? Could Omni Consumer Products take over the United States? I'll be very interested to hear all your thoughts, but if you'd rather yell at me in person, more or less, the Template Institute does have a Discord server. Follow the link in the description below and join the conversation. And as always, thanks for watching. The Templin Institute investigates alternate worlds and realities. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to directly support us, vote in polls to determine future topics, and receive some cool rewards, please consider pledging to our Patreon page.